So people often ask, can my boobs explode when I go on a plane? I didn't get the surgery done until September, but yeah. I wanted I wanted to, to research and fully know what I was doing before. Did you have Franken boobs? A, a little bit, a little bit. All right, guys, we are back. Uh, this is gonna be an IG Live about breast augmentation. So we have Tasha joining us. All right, hi, Tasha, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Awesome, all right, so everybody, welcome to our uh, session. I'm gonna adjust my video so you can kind of see me. Okay, so this is going to be an Instagram live session specifically about breast augmentations. We're going to be talking about breast augmentation surgery, the whole process. And we've been joined by Tasha here, who is an actual patient. So she'll be able to answer any questions that you may have about the process from a patient perspective. Um, Tasha, thanks for joining us. Thanks for uh, sharing your experience with us. And there's a question about postal pain. All right, first question, postal pain. Tasha, t talk us through your pain recovery. How was your pain? Well, at the beginning, like when I first got the surgery, I didn't feel anything. I was too tired and sleepy. Um, but then I think maybe from day one to day three, it was probably the worst pain. But I'd rate it like maybe a six out of 10. It wasn't that bad. Okay. Yeah. And was, this was six out of 10 on its own or with the medication? Oh, no, no, on its own. Like I didn't use medication very often. Okay. I think I stopped at day two i and i started taking half like because like half the pain medication instead of a full tab because i didn't like the full ones okay so honestly i felt like at about day three i was completely off everything i didn't need it anymore okay uh, let's talk about the medication that you were taking so we normally prescribe patients two types of painkillers a stronger one and a weaker one the stronger one is percocet and a weaker, weaker one is panel three so which ones were you using I took one Percocet, um, so the the next day after uh, the operation, and I did not like it, so I just stuck with the T3s for until day three, and then that was it. So really three days of painkiller. Yeah, that, that was and about Was this some sort of a pain that was sort of keeping it better? Were you up about walking around? Like, what, what, what did, you know, your recovery look like? Um, I was actually up and about walking around, um, probably more than I should have because I felt like I just wanted to get back to normal. Um, mm -hmm. The raising the arms, or not raising your arms was probably the worst thing for me because I wanted to do everything. Um, but other than that, no, it was just some days, I guess, when I felt like more tired, I would lay down or if I felt like my chest needed a break, I would um, relax or... I want to um sometimes i take like loosen the surgical bra a little bit because sometimes it was a little too tight um i needed a mm -hmm. bit of a break for that but then i'd always put it right back when i knew that um i needed that support again okay so pain being probably one of the biggest sort of uh, fears that patients have would mm -hmm. you would say after your breast augmentation you took one percocet at once and you took some t3s for uh, three days and after three days no more painkillers yeah, exactly. And this wasn't a this wasn't type of pain that was kept you in bed, and you were like in bed, unable to move, uh, oh, no, no, no. paralyzed. No, no. Um, I think maybe the worst thing was I would get shooting pains from this side straight to my nipple, but that mm -hmm. was it. Like it was, it wasn't all the time. It wasn't constant. It was every once in a while it would happen, and it'd feel like a sharp pain. Was it by itself, or were you like when you were moving or being active? Uh, no, just by itself. Like I guess it's the the nerves. I guess repairing themselves yeah. or something, but it was just a shooting pain, and then it lasted maybe like a couple seconds, and then it'd be over, and I was fine again. So. Yeah. So after surgery, people can experience two types of pains: actual pain, pain when when you know, you've cut the tissues and and it hurts, and then you have nerves that are being cut that randomly fire, and this is typical after any surgical procedure. Uh, people describe this as you can have a little shooting pain. You have pins and needles, electric shocks, itchiness. Uh, this is nerves yeah. when they're firing randomly and giving these the weird sensations. And it's perfectly normal. It does subside over time. In some patients, it either takes too long, it's too annoying, or it's just not getting better. In those situations, we can give them medication for their creams that help to soothe irritated nerves. What are the chances of your body rejecting an implant? Well, with implants, there's no such thing as rejection. It's, it's not like an organ where your immune system attacks and rejects it. Whenever you put a foreign body inside your body, your body acts by walling it off creates a capsule scar tissue around it that, that's that's the capsule that forms about around every implant whether it's a breast implant hip replacement knee replacement whatever it is people you know people from wars have blood wounds in them these bloods get encapsulated in a 
in a scar tissue called a capsule, and that is how your body reacts to it. So it doesn't really reject it like a transplant. So there's no rejection. Um, then we have a question about fat transfer to breast. Um, you can use fat transfer, but fat transfer is very limited. At best, gives you half a cup size increase. Um, Dash, a question for you. How long after uh, did you get your permanent augmented shape? So how many months are you now since your surgery? I think it's five and a half. Or... And when did you feel like you've sort of reached the point where your breasts stopped changing and kind of finalized their, their appearance? I feel like maybe now. Like, they're, I guess, the softest they've ever looked. And they, they feel more mm -hmm. natural. They don't, because before I kept feeling like the actual implant underneath, I would feel it slide across my chest wall, which was a very strange mm -hmm. feeling. Um, and it felt kind of like very, very strange. Uh, but now they just feel more, a lot more like me. And I'm not like, when I move my arms, I don't like rub against them like okay. how I used to. It feels more like they're a part of me now. Okay. So, yeah, I feel like now. <laughs> Question from Amy. She's a hairstylist. She's asking, how long before you were able to lift your arms up? So I tell patients not to lift your arms up for about two weeks, and then you can start lifting your arms up. What was your experience like? It was basically the time that you said. I felt like maybe a couple days just before I followed up with you when you had said not to raise your arms for the two weeks. But I think at that mm -hmm. two-week mark or a little bit before, I felt like, I was fine to do it, but I didn't want to risk it. So I waited until your direction and then I was okay to lift them. I didn't feel like any pain. There was nothing like I couldn't do. I think the only thing that was the worst is like trying to raise it all the way back. Cause like I do mm -hmm. gymnastics, right? So having to have that back and shoulder flexibility um, is important. So to raise it all the way back was a little uncomfortable. It just felt like the muscle was tight and it had to loosen up a little bit. And then now like I can do it no problem. So are you back to gymnastics now? Yes, yes. When did you start doing gymnastics again? Um, at the, I think it's the three month mark okay. when you said I was okay to do it. So I tried doing it. Um, it does feel a little like strange. Like when I, I used to be able to do like full push ups. Like I didn't have to go on my knees. Now yeah. I do have to go on my knees because the muscle is a lot weaker. Yeah. Um, but it did feel like a, not a good feeling like a, like more of a ripping sensation if I try to do too much. Mm -hmm. So I took that as my muscle is not ready to to do that kind of rigorous training. So yeah. I have to slowly work into it. And it's getting better. Like I can do push-ups on my knees, no problem. Okay. But, yes. um, so th that's a good point. Um, that was a question that went by about over the muscle, under the muscle. So when you go under the muscle, the benefits to going under the muscle, the downside of going under the muscle is that when, the, when you're under the muscle and the implant sitting here and the muscle's on top, every time the muscle contracts, it pushes on the implant. So the, the breast moves, so you get what's called animation deformity. And two, you do interfere with the function of the, of the pec muscle. So your pec becomes a little bit weaker. Most people probably don't notice this. You as a gymnast, uh, people are bodybuilders, fitness people, probably will notice a little bit of a decrease in pec function. And frankly, I would recommend that people get implants under the muscle, uh, maybe avoid doing stuff like um, push-ups or bench press and flies. Just... Don't, maybe don't use your pec muscle so much. If you're a bodybuilder, if, if pec muscle is an absolute necessity for you, that is one of the reasons why I would ever go over the muscle. And for bodybuilders, uh, I typically recommend that they do go over the muscle. Natasha, you're under the muscle, right? Yes. Predominant majority of my patients go under the muscle uh, for two reasons. I like going under the muscle. And two, most people, when they do their research, they read about under the muscle and choose to, to, to go this way. I do like to go over the muscle in specific cases. One, uh, people that are overly active with the pec muscles, and we don't want to interfere with the pectoral muscle, like bodybuilders and fitness fanatics. And two, people that may have a breast itself that is sitting low on their chest, below where the muscle is, and there's a sort of a misalignment of the breast tissue and the muscle tissue, and I want to allow the implant to fall down um, so I could do what's called a dual plane where I release the muscle completely and allow the implant to come down or simply go over the muscle. Um, I'm not a big fan of dual plane because in my opinion, dual plane over long term becomes a subglandular space. So you might as well just skip that initial phase, not cut the muscle, not damage the muscle and go directly into the over the muscle space. All right. Um, a little bit of a personal question, Natasha, but how long do you have to wait until you become intimate with your partner? So my answer to that is uh, think of it as a, vigorous physical activity. I tell patients for six weeks, nothing. That includes 
intimate activities with your partner. You don't have to be doing anything where your breasts can potentially get moved, displaced, or anything else like that uh, because you, know, you spend all this time getting your breast augmentation. Don't mess it up. Don't displace the implants. Uh, question about roller coasters. I know roller coasters have the disclaimer saying if you have breast implants, you shouldn't be on them. I have no idea why that is. Uh, um, yes, you can. Unless you have breasts like Dolly Parton, when you go down, they kind of hit in the face. I, I can't think of any other reason why you shouldn't be able to go on a, on a roller coaster. I, I think people think that the, the implant will move around all over the place, but it doesn't. It, it's, it's there. It's not. Yeah. A normal breast wouldn't be flying around and going crazy. Exactly. So it's just, it's more... It's like it's, it's, if anything, I could see women that have larger breasts, like natural larger breasts, their yes. breasts will yes. move a lot more than if you were to have um, implants under there because the implants kind of keep the shape. Exactly. More so they're not going to be like up here <laughs> if you drop down. Like they, they're like any other boob. They're normal. They don't move around like that. <laughs> uh, again, going to over under the muscle. Uh, Living Colorfully was asking, do I recommend going over or under? Um, it depends on the patient. Most of the time, I recommend going under the muscle. But like I just mentioned, there's a specific situation where I do recommend over the muscle. Uh, over the muscle used to be popular. Then it became under the muscle. Now, over the muscle is making a comeback. Again, there are some surgeons out there who uh, talk about it being over. Um, and again, they have pros and cons. My two reasons why I like to go under the muscle is under the muscle, there's a slight low risk of capsule contracture. And two, I often use the muscle to support implant so they don't fall so much and they stay higher up. Um, and they, you probably need a longer time then uh, to come back and get a redo and lift them up. Because if you go over the muscle, over time, as your natural breast, the implants do add weight to your breast and they'll come down and you'll have saggy breasts that then need to be lifted up. Um, Lisa's asking, Tasha, how long after your consultation was your surgery? I, I don't remember. What was the time frame between consultation and the procedure? Oh, I wanted to, I wanted to give myself a lot of time to, to go through any questions that I had, um, fully research what I was doing. So I think it was in, I feel like the consultation was in either January or February. Mm -hmm. And then I didn't get the surgery done until September. I just wanted to give myself that extra time. Some people I know, they went like a couple months later, but yeah. I wanted I wanted to, to research and fully know what I was doing before yeah. I did. So Lisa, to answer your question, in general, most people, um, us breast, breast augmentation specifically, uh, breast augmentation patients usually have a short time between a consultation and, and the surgery itself. Um, uh, we kind of joke about this. People with breast implants that come in one of breast implants, it's always like a boob emergency, like they want it immediately right away. So we do try to squeeze them in fairly quickly. Other procedures, uh, patients take a little longer time to sort of digest the information and get themselves ready. But for breast augmentation specifically, um, those patients tend to have a shorter window between consultation and surgery. Um, so I'm not sure if that answers your question. Uh, then there's a question from uh, Rose. Uh, Rose Lair, about how many cup sizes you go up. So what size was your implant and how many cup sizes did you change? So um, my implant size was 450 cc. It was either a choice between that or the 485, but we agreed on the 450 cc because I'm more active. It was better to go with a smaller implant. Um, and my cup size before, now this is in uh, Lisenza sizes. I don't know if Lisenza and Victoria's Secret kind of have the same kind of size structure. Um, but my size before was an A cup, and now it's a double D. Okay. Uh, what's your height and weight, just so people can know? So my height is 5'7", and my weight at the time was, I believe, 120. Okay. Uh, Cupcake over there keeps asking over and over about breast implant illness. Um, breast implant illness is a... Is a um, 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 an entity that's all over the social media and people talk about it a lot. Um, there, there, there are no real studies yet that you know have really found anything about it. So people often ask us about it. What is what is what is my opinion on breast implant illness? Um, I only have an opinion because there's no actual studies out there. Just like the breast implant illness, people have no studies to support us. In the many many years that I've been in practice. I have yet to see a real breast implant illness. I've had a few patients that thought they had breast implant illness. We had two patients that thought they had it. And even before they came in to see me, they were diagnosed with other medical conditions which were treated. And once they were treated, the breasts felt perfectly fine. 
I had one patient who insisted on having breast implant illness, and I agreed to take out her implants. When I did that, uh, we did a very close look at everything. I want to see what's going on. Um, if you think that breast, breast implants are these evil things that are creating all these problems, that are creating all this inflammation, autoimmune disorder, then you would expect that there'd be a lot of inflammatory reactions around the implants. You'd think the capsule would really think the breast tissue would be inflamed. There'd be a lot of changes going on. What I found in this particular patient is that when we took out the implant, the implant was pristine. There was nothing wrong with the implant. There was no degradation. There was nothing weird looking about the implant. The capsule itself around the implant was as good as it could possibly be. It was paper thin. It was membranous thin. I, I try to show this when I do these procedures. I show people what a capsule looks like. There was no contracture. There was no inflammation whatsoever. So uh, to answer the question about breast implant illness is I have never seen it. In many, many years and thousands of breast implants that I've done, I have not seen a patient who actually had breast implant illness. Now, I've read all the stories out there. There are stories out there that are pretty convincing, and there are people out there that seem unwell. And, you know, we, we, can't, we can't deny that some people may not be well. I don't know why. There has yet to be any study, any scientific evidence to prove that really what's going on is implant-related. They may be unwell. Could it be real implants? Could it not be implants? We don't know. It is possible that there's some weird reaction that someone could possibly have to a compound or something in the implants. But in general, if people are scared of breast implant illness, all I can tell you in my experience, because there's no published papers on this, is that in thousands of breast implants I've done, I have never seen it. So I hope that answers your question, and we'll move on to the, to the next questions. Difference between silicone and saline. So Natasha, do you, do you have silicone or saline? I don't remember. I have silicone. Silicone implants. So silicone implant is, a, is an implant that is a silicone shell and is filled with silicone gel. Saline implant also is a silicone shell, but it's filled with water, salt water. On the surface, they look the same, and people ask, which is better? Which, which is a more natural-looking implant, silicone or saline? And the answer is they're equally good-looking. The difference is in the feel. Silicone feels a little bit softer, Saline could be a little bit harder or softer, depending on how you feel it. Silicone tends to have less rippling than saline. When you put them side by side on a table, yes, silicone looks and feels smoother, softer, all is great. However, when you put them inside into a human body, under the muscle, under the breast tissue, and you have all this soft tissue covering the implant, it becomes much more difficult to, to differentiate between them. And that is the reason why I am one of the few people that actually do like using saline implants because I really don't think there's anything wrong with them. We don't push them on anybody. And Tasha here, for example, had a silicone implant. I do whatever the patient asks for. I don't push my opinion on anybody, but I'm not somebody who poops silicone implants and says they're bad and they should never be used um, as some people may do. So question for you, Tasha, why did you decide to go with silicone versus saline? Um, it was just more preference. I, I just like the idea of uh, silicone I thought um, before surgery, it was going to be like a lot softer. Cause you know, when you go in, you feel them, you're like, oh, this is a lot softer than the saline, which I know you say once it goes under the muscle, it doesn't really matter so much, but I think it was just more, I wanted to make myself uh, feel better by getting that. Um, I was worrying. But, but, about, but why? What, what did you read about them that made you want to go with silicone? Um, they just sort of had more of a natural feel um, especially if you're smaller, because um, I had very limited breast tissue. Mm -hmm. um, I just wanted the most natural look. I didn't want to, you know, look too fake or anything. Um, I was worried that uh, there was going to be stretch marks. I was very, very concerned. But um, your nurse, um, Nurse Kim, I love her so much. She's amazing. Uh, she she told me that usually you won't get uh, stretch marks because stretch marks is more of a hormonal thing. Yeah. So I thought that you know, once it goes under the body, all of a sudden I'm going to get these lines and it was going to look crazy. But that was not the case. I have no stretch marks. I have uh, no rippling, none of that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, so stretch marks is a concern people sometimes have. And yeah, it's mostly hormonal. Um, People associate with stretching skin, but it's not really stretching skin mm -hmm. uh, because most often you see stretch marks in pregnant women after pregnancy, but sometimes you see stretch marks in people that never got pregnant. Um, they just went through hormonal changes. Um, the other thing though is silicone saline, doesn't matter what implant it is, it, it really has no impact on stretch marks. So 
Um, the, the reason why some would want to choose a silicone implant is when they're very, very lean and skinny, fit like you, Tasha, when you have a very thin layer of skin, you can feel the implant a little bit more. So it's a little bit softer, a little bit smoother. Um, those would be the two reasons why some would go with silicone. Um, the stretch mark part has nothing to do with silicone versus saline discussion. How long do you have to wait until you can have some physical activity like light exercises? So, Tasha, tell us about your return to physical activity. Can you give us a time out of how you started moving? Um, I started, like, after you gave the go-ahead, I think it was, like, six weeks, where I could start mm -hmm. doing light um, activity. I was doing um, a bit of cardio. Uh, I was mainly working my legs. So this um, is before six weeks. Sorry? This was before or after six weeks? After six weeks. Okay. Now... We talk about six weeks, sorry to interrupt you, but I want, I want to make it very clear to all our, our listeners is that six weeks is when you get back to strenuous physical activity. But before six weeks, you were still active. You were not lying in bed, immobilized. You were moving around, but you're just being careful, correct? Yes, exactly. Um, okay. I was thinking more like in the gym, exercising. Um, and then I didn't fully feel comfortable doing anything with my chest until roughly about three months. Um, it, it still caused, like, there was still some uncomfortability with it. I mean, I'm getting a lot better now. I, I took actually my first uh, yoga class, like, after having surgery um, last weekend. And that was pretty good. I did well. I didn't worry about, you know, not being strong enough. I, I could mm -hmm. keep up with the class, which was good. Um, so... I think anywhere between like three months to maybe like five, five or six months now where I'm feeling like the most comfortable doing okay. kind of workouts. Uh, up to next question. Alana is asking, how long did your chest feel tight? Maybe for a month to two months. That was like the most, and like it's super soft now. Like there's, there's no issue, but before it was like, they sat up pretty high. It was, it did was you have friends groups? Sorry? Did you have Franken boobs? A, a little bit, a little bit. It wasn't like super square like I saw uh, for some people, but it was just very like fake looking. Mm -hmm. um, but I, you know, I was pushing down and that kind of stuff. And then they, they dropped nicely. One was dropping a little faster than the other. Um, but I, it wasn't that bad. I think mainly the tightness wasn't the issue. It was more itchiness for me. It was very, mm -hmm. very itchy. And um, underneath, I still have some numbness. Mm -hmm. I don't know how they long. Can take, they can take many, many months. That's perfectly normal. Yes, okay. Because before it was like this whole area was numb, but now it's good here up until just like this spot underneath. Exactly. So the, the nerves come from your spine. So like, like you demonstrated, they come from the back and they keep moving forward as the nerves regenerate and come back to the front. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, I see there was a question a few times someone was asking about breastfeeding. Um, implants do not interfere with your ability to breastfeed. Implants don't go in your breast. Implants go under the breast. So when we go through the armpit, I go directly under the muscle. When I go through the breast wall, I go under the muscle or under the breast. The only time we actually cut into the breast tissue is when we do the perioral approach, when we cut through the areola to go through the breast tissue, under the muscle or under the breast tissue. That may interfere with your breastfeeding, but the other ones, we're not touching your breast whatsoever. There's zero impact on your breastfeeding ability. Better to get breast implants after having children. Well, like with any cosmetic procedure, if you think of having children anytime soon, wait. But if you think of having children five, ten years from now, then why wait? You know, why spend the best years of your life waiting? That that'll be my answer. After children, your breasts. Uh, after pregnancy, your breasts will go through changes, and there's a good chance that you may need some sort of touch up to fix them up. You may need a lift. You may lose volume. There's all kinds of things can, that may happen. And so for that reason, people may say, well, wait until after pregnancy. So you don't, instead of having two surgeries, you only have one. True. But again, if, if you're going to be pregnant in five to 10 years, why spend the best years of your life waiting um, for something that may or may not happen? Question from Barry asking, how do you know if you need a breast lift? If you look like your breasts are falling before below your breast fold, uh, then you may need a breast lift. If you're unsure, uh, talk to a plastic surgeon. Uh, question about replacing breast implants. How often do you replace them? Uh, there was an older study many, many years ago for the third generation of breast implants that said you should replace them every 10 years because they found that in 10 years, 50% of them, of them would break. Um, that has changed now. The recommendation now is there's no need to go and do preventative surgery. Let them be unless there's a problem. 
if you have silicone implants, you do not know if you have a problem unless you do an MRI. If you have sealed implants, if they leak, your breast deflates you know, right away. And that's one of the advantages of sealing implants. All right. I saw a question about sleeping on your stomach. Okay. Um, they asked, I guess, how long after can you sleep on your stomach? Um, what was the recommended time that you had given your patients to, to six sleep weeks. on? The answer to all the questions is six weeks, weeks. just like my name. <laughs> so um, when you first get it done, uh, you have to be on an angle, right? You have to sleep on your back, but on an angle. Yes. So like, was, uh, I have one of those like cushions that you put your arms there and you lean back. Yeah. Um, and I put a lot of pillows behind me. It was extremely uncomfortable. Um, that was probably the worst part too, because you can't actually like, even if your back gets stiff, you can't crack your back because you can, you can't stretch that far because the muscle is so tight. Um, yeah. So that wasn't that fun. Um, but as soon as I got the go ahead to sleep in my stomach, because I am a stomach sleeper, I went right onto my stomach and I tried to lay there and I couldn't do it for too long because it would feel like they were pushing uh, too far one way or they just didn't feel that supported. I tried to wear, you know, more supportive uh, sports bras and that helped a little bit because it kept them in one place. But mm -hmm. putting all that pressure on my, on my chest um, didn't feel that good. So I would grab like a pillow and I put a pillow here and then I put a pillow underneath here so that my, I was elevated. So my, my breasts were like not pushing down on the bed, but had a bit of like, you know, breathing room. Yeah. And that worked out for me. And then now I can sleep on my stomach, no problem. There's no issue. I don't have to wear a bra to sleep on, on my stomach. It's, it's fine. Question, can you lie on your side after the procedure? So not for six weeks, but now it's been a while. Do you lie on your side, Tasha? What does it feel like? Yeah, I lie on my side now. It doesn't uh, feel like anything. But at first when I did, it felt um, like if I were to lay on this side, this one would push more to the center of my chest, which mm -hmm. that one wasn't the issue, but it was the bottom one because the bottom one would push more to the bed and that would feel very uncomfortable. It felt like I was, uh, I don't know. It felt like something was like pushing into my side mm -hmm. a little bit because it was moving over so much and it, it just felt really like not comfortable. So I would like go back up. Like it was a lot of like shifting and moving um, if I would lay that way, I was okay for maybe five minutes, but then I'd have to readjust again because it would start to get uncomfortable and then go to the other side five minutes again. So I think when you're after the surgery and you're getting more comfortable with that, there's going to be those little moments of, okay, this is uncomfortable. I have to move. This is uncomfortable. Again, I have to move. But after yeah. a while, it gets so like, you get so used to it. You don't even feel it anymore. Like I can lay on my chest i can i can do anything it doesn't bother me anymore one of the things that people sometimes mention i said there was a question about it <clears throat> is do you feel tightness on your chest is it difficult to breathe so sometimes people uh complain or describe this pressure on their chest do you feel any pressure on your chest with the implants uh the first day after i did like it felt like i was i had short of breath but it didn't feel like some people said like an elephant sitting on your chest it did not feel like that for me it didn't really affect my breathing it was just more like if i tried to push my arms back i couldn't because it was so tight so it's mm -hmm. like if you worked out your chest extremely hard and you're very very sore you wouldn't be able to stretch your arms back that much anyways so it's it's the equivalent to that okay and uh, there's a question about capsule contractures so capsule contracture is about one percent one to two percent is the risk of capsule contracture it's a lifetime risk most capsule contractures do happen within the first year of surgery um, and then so the, the, the risk drops off, but never goes down to zero. Uh, there was also a question by the traveling coach about, she has a capsule contracture, grade two, so it's a mild contracture. It means that the breast feels a little bit hard, but doesn't look bad. Uh, should you wait? If you want to have kids in two to three years, I'd say, yeah, wait. After you finish having kids, whatever touch-ups need to be done for your breast can be come up with a capsule contracture release and, and have it done all at the same time. Can a patient who have asthma get a breast augmentation? Absolutely. Um, if you have any medical condition, it's not a contraindication to surgery, as long as the medical condition is well controlled and it's not going to interfere with the surgery itself or your recovery. Um, meaning the, the, the 
medical condition itself or the medication. Sometimes people take medications that are immunosuppressive, that increase risk of infection, interfere with wound healing. So as long as all of this is under control and those particular medications can be stopped, then you should be able to go ahead and have elective surgery. People do have surgeries with other medical conditions, but these are medically necessary surgeries. So if it's an elective surgery, we want to make sure that you're overall healthy or your medical conditions are well controlled before you go ahead with what's considered elective, i.e. not necessary procedure. Um, question from Abby about what does it mean when we overfill a ceiling implant? So ceiling implant um, is meant to be filled to a certain volume and plus there's a bit of an overfill. Uh, there's a range to what, you, what you're supposed to fill it in. I like to overfill my implants a little bit. It makes them a little bit harder, but it minimizes rippling. So rippling being the visual thing that people can see, we want to minimize it by overfilling. Hope, hopefully that answers your question. Um, people that are good candidates for breast fold is everybody. People that are good candidates for armpit are people that have smaller breasts, that don't have a lot of droopiness, don't have a lot of asymmetries that need to be corrected because the breast fold, uh, the armpit approach has a limited ability in correcting little imperfections. Question about implants feeling heavy. So Tasha, you have you know, above average, shall we say volume, do they feel heavy for you? No, they don't. How would you describe, like, do, do you feel the weight? Do you feel the additional weight on your chest? I know I don't. It just feels like, I don't even think I've gained any weight on the on the scale when I checked, because I was excited. I thought maybe it would be like a pound or two, but I don't even you think must, I- You must have. I, I don't know. <laughs> Implants add extra weight, as a little, just, just to be serious. They do add weight, so you will gain weight. So you have 450, so a total of 900 grams, which is two pounds. So you should be about two pounds heavier. And people get used to them, but don't forget, you do have extra weight on your chest, so you do need to wear about that. There's a misconception if you get breast implants, you never have to wear bra ever again. Not true. Think about it. You've just added weight to your chest. They're not anti-gravity devices. They're weights. Yeah. Well, they don't. I don't know. I never noticed like a feeling like sometimes if I now go down the stairs because I didn't have anything before, I will feel them like move a bit, but it's nothing mm -hmm. like they're so heavy. I got to like rest them on anything. It doesn't feel like that. And there was a question about bras. Uh, first of all, do you, is it better to not wear bra for natural bras? I'm aware there's a study from friends. There's one study that said that people who don't wear bras are better off. Um, makes no sense to me. Uh, simple answer to that is look, look, at, look at the National Geographic movies from Africa, from Amazon, all these women that don't wear bras. They don't have perky breasts. I rest my case. Um, do you recommend wearing a bra to bed? I do, because when you stand, gravity goes down. When you lie down, your gravity actually is pulling the breast to the side because I realize that your chest is on a flat plate. So when you're lying down, implants are not on a flat plate. They're on a curve or, or a curved surface that's going sideways. So it's nice to wear a bra that's gonna hold them together. Otherwise, over time, they do fall to the side. And when that happens, that is perfectly normal. That's not a Bosch job. There's nothing wrong with your implants. It's called gravity. It is something that you should expect over a long time, just like people with larger breasts. When ask a woman who has larger breasts what happens when she lies down, she'll tell you they fall to the side and flat is chest because all the volume from the front is now off in the armpits. Gravity. I have yet to cure gravity. I'm still working on it. Cupcake is asking about foreign. Is it is it a big or small? Um, same implants can look very different on different people. It depends on proportion to your body, right? So on a very petite person, forehead's gonna look humongous. On me, I'm six one. They're probably gonna look pretty small. So it all depends on on the person. And that, that's an important thing to remember because a lot of people sort of do their little research when they come for a consultation. They find a picture and say, "This girl's got 350 cc's. They look perfect. I want to get 350." It doesn't work like that. On her, 350 may look good but she's a completely different person, different height, different weight, different pre-existing breasts, that doesn't apply to you. So when people do their research and wanna you know, do wish picks, find a look and a shape that you like, bring it to show us, but let's, let's not worry about the numbers because the numbers are gonna be very, very different. Exactly. Publi says, you look great, thank you very much. Or, are you talking about me or Tasha? I don't know. <laughs> um, how often as a surgeon do you have revisions or is it capsule contracture, bottom line, is it common? Um, luckily, not too often. Uh, we all do revision touch-ups. I do revisions on my own patients, not on people that had surgery elsewhere. Um, and once in a while, we have a, like a procedure day where I squeeze in revisions where I just add them at the end of a surgical day. Yeah. Question about internal bras. I don't do them. I only do them when I, when I do reconstructive cases if someone needs a reconstruction. I don't do them in primary cases when it's a fresh, brand, brand new breast. Uh, going back to scars. Yes, everybody scars a little bit differently. Um, I think we're 
I, I would say we're known for our scars, tiny, tiny scars. But despite my best efforts, not every single one of my patients has a perfect scar. Uh, the reason why a scar may not look good could be there's too much tension on the scar, there was an infection in the scar, the scar wasn't closed meticulously well enough, or the patient simply is genetically prone to abnormal scars. And there are patients that I have that no matter how good of a job I make, um, they will get a hypertrophic or keloid scars. And these patients you see, um, they look beautiful right after surgery. They have pristine scars, beautiful thin line. They look great for about three months. And after three months, they start developing hypertrophic scars, which is a typical time frame when this starts to happen. People that have that problem, unfortunately, there's really little you can do. You can do injections, catalog injections, um, uh, injection of other sort of uh, medication to try to minimize the excessive response because that's what it is. Your body is overreacting to the formation of scar tissue. Um, Tasha, what, how big is your scar? So you have silicone implants. Silicone yes. implants typically require big scars. Now, I use Instaboob. Uh, it's, it's a funnel device, which I can't say because... Uh, Otherwise, that that'd be that's not allowed. I can't be promoting uh, equipment, but I, so I, I I call it Instaboob. Uh, but it's a device that I use to squeeze implants in. So it allows me to take, a, to take a big implant and squeeze it in for a small incision. So Tasha, in your situation, can you like tell us how, approximately how many centimeters is your incision? Um, I don't know how many. I know it's like this, and it's very very thin line. Um, I have a little bit of like pinkish reddish kind of discoloration around it. Mm -hmm. But I know that that will fade. And I also have been using, actually, I have it here. I've been using this. <laughs> That's scar cream. So we recommend to our patients to use scar care, any product. doesn't matter what the brand name is, as long as it has silicone in it. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I noticed it's been helping. Um, I used to use the strips before. This one is one that you, like, wipe on. Um, uh -huh. It's. I guess it's more preference. Um, I started off with the strips. They were fine. Uh, these ones... This one's like the liquid's kind of like nail polish you mm -hmm. put on. Um, I might switch back to the strips again just because, I don't know, it was just more convenience just to keep it on and I don't have to worry about it. This one, you have to keep doing it every, I think, twice a day or mm -hmm. something like that. So, Good. yeah. Uh, there was a question about breast implants, uh, different profiles. So there's moderate, high, ultra, ultra high. Um, I rarely use ultra high profile because they're almost like shaped implants and if they flip, they don't look very good, so I don't like to use them. And there was also a question about Motor Plus. So online people talk about Motor Plus. Motor Plus is the term used by a company called Mentor. I use Allergan implants. Same shape, same profile, but in Allergan, they're called Moderate. So what Mentor calls Moderate Plus, Allergan calls Moderate, just to give you a little perspective. Bima is asking, if you don't have volume on top, uh, would implants show? Implants will show when you're skinny. So someone who's super, super lean will show implants no matter what you do. Implants are hidden when the more fat you have on top of the of the mass of the, of the implant, the less of an implant you will see. So hopefully that answers your question. There was a question of if you can do breast augmentation with a lipo and BBL. Technically yes. However, how will you sleep afterwards? After breast augmentation, you're gonna sleep on your back. After BBL, you're gonna sleep on your stomach. So I don't like to combine front and back procedures. All right, let's see. Uh, is transaxial here more painful than breast fold? Uh, yes, it is, unfortunately, but it's, it's a matter of extra pain for uh, a matter of days, not a lifetime of pain. So uh, the price you pay for extra pain for the first few days, but then you have no scars for the rest of your life on your breast, I think that that's a pretty reasonable trade-off. So I wouldn't use pain as a sort of detractor from going through the armpit if that's the way you want to go. Uh, would you combine uh, breast augmentation and labiaplasty? Yeah, that, that's a pretty common combination, by the way. And again, that's possible simply because they're both from procedures. Um, question from Quinn, is the gummy bear same as ideal implant or are they different? So ideal implant is a saline-based implant. It says, but unlike a typical sandwich, just like a balloon of water, it's got multiple chambers meant to simulate the look and feel of a silicone, but it's not a silicone. Gummy bear is silicone. Gummy bear, silicone, cohesive gel. Gummy bear, silicone, cohesive gel. Those three things, they're all the same. Do all breast implants cost around the same, even if you're going to go a little bit fuller? Yeah. So breast implant fees don't depend on how big of an implant you choose. You could go super small, super big. The fee is the same. Do I still use the Kela funnel? I do. I can't say Keller. I'll say Instaboob. 
how long after breast implantation can a patient fly immediately? I know. Have you traveled, Tasha, since yes, your breast implantation? I went to Costa Rica uh, February 1st. Okay, very nice. How was that? That was fine. Didn't feel any pressure, nothing. So people often ask, can my boobs explode when I go on a plane? The answer is no. There's no reason for them to explode. Um, I think it was like one of those uh, TV shows, Thousand Ways of Dying. And I, 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 I have no idea how that happened. No, your, your breast implants will not explode if you go up in a plane. And Tasha's still alive. Yeah. <laughs> Britad is asking about smoking weed. Should you stop? You should stop at least two weeks. Um, what it does, it, it interferes with the effectiveness of the anesthesia and pain medication. So people that smoke weed are more prone to pain. Uh, or let me phrase it, pain medication is going to be less effective. So if you don't want to have pain, stop at least two weeks before surgery because otherwise our painkillers will not be effective in controlling your pain. How long after surgery can you bathe normally? Um, I tell my patients, uh, don't get your wounds wet for a week. You come back for a one-week check. We take, a, uh, we take a look at you, and then you can take a shower. But probably soaking in water, mm, I would say three to four weeks. Just want to make sure there's no openings or whatsoever in your incisions. Um, Tasha, t t talk to us about your um, washing hygiene after the surgery. How was that? How, how did you survive not taking a shower for a week and all that uh, stuff? That wasn't that fun. I would, like, wash around, like, any other parts. Not, like, soaking wet water, but you know, like a damp rag with some soap on it. I wanted to make sure that I was okay. Um, when I first got the bandages wet, like, cause when they, they took off uh, the, the larger bandages and they had just the ones covering the incisions, um, I was so afraid to get them wet. I was like holding while I would like wash myself in the shower. Um, the water hitting my breast in the shower because uh, they were so sensitive it felt uncomfortable, like just, mm -hmm. just the pressure of the water, especially on my nipples, it was very uncomfortable. Um, but that was fine. And I think once I got the bandages fully removed, she sprayed this kind of stuff on them. It was like a liquid Band-Aid or something. Yep. Um, and I think I was allowed to get that wet, but I think it would wash off right away. Um, but my incisions had already healed up well, like, what, what, no did you do, what did you do during the first week when you were not allowed to take a shower oh i would just wash like the rest of my body like, yeah i would sit in the bath but not like submerge my... did, you, did, did you wash your hair uh yeah see i was very smart about this um i don't know if anyone else has uh natural hair this would be more for the women with curly hair or anything like that because my hair is a lot more high maintenance um i made sure that i got um my hair twisted or uh braided before mm -hmm. i did it so i just left it in the braids i didn't have to worry about it um until my basically my recovery was over and then i got them taken out and then i was fine because then i could move my arms again okay awesome. so that was a smart move on my part <laughs> Uh, there's a question um, about why did you get breast implants? So that's a great question. Some people have reasonable breasts. Some people want to like, you know, you look good already. Why get breast implants? So in your situation, why did you choose that you want to get breast implants? Well, I'm a big fan of proportions. And I have a little bit of a bigger lower body. Um, and then I have larger shoulders. So I just felt like I have wider shoulders. I have like a little wider of a lower body and I have nothing in between and it was just more the aesthetic clothes didn't fit nicely um I didn't feel all that comfortable every time I would go out and be like oh like if I was wearing a sweater like you could tell I had nothing or if I was wearing a shirt I would never want to wear anything because I didn't feel like a woman and I just I felt like I was just so unproportionate and so I didn't want to go like massive but I didn't want to just increase it a little bit. I wanted that kind of medium. What, what cup size were you before and what are you now? It was an A size before. Okay, and what like are you now? Also in uh, Lacenza sizes, which I think are a little bit smaller. Okay. So I could have been a little less in A. Um, and especially if I did more physical activity, they would go completely. So um, now that also in Lacenza sizes, they're in double D. Um, I feel like, like there's, there's still at the point where I can hide them if I want to. 
right? Like all of my clothes still fit. That's fine. Um, cause I didn't go that big, but obviously the bras don't fit anymore. Um, but if I want to show them off, I can show them off. And I'm really happy about that. I actually like showing them off now as before I would feel scared to go out in public if I were to wear a bit of a, like a, a lower top. Awesome. Uh, that's a good point. I want to continue on. You mentioned your bras don't fit anymore. Um, there, there's a little initiative that we're starting in our clinic. Uh, we, we do so many transformations for so many patients. And as a result, usually their old clothes don't fit as much as they used to before, and they usually get rid of them. So what we're going to be doing for our clinic, and if you want one of our patients, is we're going to be asking our patients to come and donate their old clothes that don't fit anymore. We'll be doing a clothing drive for people that can't afford to buy clothes. So that's something we'll be initiating in our clinic. So again, if, I, if you're one of our patients, you're coming for a follow-up, and you have clothes that no longer fit you because uh, your bra is too small or your pants are too big, uh, please uh, donate them and we'll, we'll donate them to the needy. So I'm going to finish off our, uh, our IG live here. So again, thank you very much, everybody. Thanks, Tasha, for joining us. That was awesome. Thank you. Great, have a good day. <laughs> Thanks, you too.